It was a mix of congeniality and confrontation. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, not you. Not you. Your organization's terrible. Your organization's terrible. Let's go. Go ahead. Quiet. Quiet. Go ahead. She's, she's asking a question. Don't be rude. Don't be rude. Don't be rude. No, I'm not going to give you a question. I'm not going to give you a question. All right, a whiff of uh, what a Trump presidency might be like in eight days' time. His first press conference since July, salacious tales of uh, Russian hotel room sex tape blackmail could well be fake news, as uh, he contends. But even assuming that it's the case, what damage to Trump uh, and to U.S. democracy has it all had the Russian hacking story? Will Trump continue to play down reports of Moscow's meddling in the campaign? Uh, Trump, uh, for the first time, saying, yes, Moscow is responsible, but also sh meeting out blame to others. Trump's uh, biggest issue, though, on day one, may perhaps isn't Russia at all. The press conference taking place at Trump Tower, a building where a Chinese state-owned bank and Qatar Airways both rent space, those are just two of the many, many business ties between the Donald and partners, domestic and foreign, that could uh, mean conflicts of interest once he's in office. The founding fathers in the U.S. enshrined in the Constitution that uh, the principle that office holders cannot curry favor from foreign powers. Could Trump's business empire be impossible to untangle? And could he be, in fact, some even argue, impeachable on day one? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at how Trump faced the press with us, former U.S. diplomat uh, William Jordan. Hi, Francois. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Ha Happy New Year uh, to uh, foreign policy consultant Molly McHugh, recently wrote a column in Politico entitled Putin's Really Long Game. Thank you for being with us from Washington. Is that Thanks better? for having me. And from Philadelphia, he's a former speechwriter for George W. Bush, Michael Johns, co-founder of the National Tea Party Movement and Heritage Foundation po policy analyst. Nice to see you again. Hey, it's a pleasure. How are you? The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, the hashtag F24debate. Phony stuff. That's how Donald Trump characterized the latest allegations against him, adding, yes, Russia was hacking, but it could have been others also. Okay. Putin likes Donald Trump. Guess what, folks? That's called an asset, not a liability. Now, I don't know that I'm going to get along with Vladimir Putin. I hope I do, but there's a good chance I won't. And if I don't, do you honestly believe that Hillary would be tougher on Putin than me? Does anybody in this room really believe that? Give me a break. All right. Uh, before I uh, turn to Molly McHugh for her reaction on this, uh, let's say hello as well to Caroline Fredrickson, president of the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy, who's in the U.S. Capitol. Thank you for being with us. Uh, Molly McHugh, let me begin with you. Uh, did you have a sense there that uh, Donald Trump has changed his tack when it comes to Russian hacking? Uh, I don't know if it's a change or if it's consistency, because there's been a lot of up and down on this. I think that um, the interesting part is he said, I think it was probably Russia, or, but, but you know, other people hack stuff too, which is his way of constantly creating an uncertain narrative. Um, but he also responded by very clearly saying he has no Russian business ties, he has no ties to Russian interests, that he does not believe anyone operating with his authority in his campaign was um, you know, conducting any of these types of operations that were described in the leaked reports. Um, and that's a, a pretty big line to put down, um, knowing that every journalist that has their hands on that document is going to be looking for ways to verify or rebut any of those um, allegations. So it is, um, it's an interesting point in his response. Um, I think the only way he can really continue to shake off some of these concerns about his relationship with Russia is to clearly articulate a Russian policy from, um, from his administration that's in the American interest. What did you make of this document? Is it something that's worth talking about? Should it have been put out there? 
I think, um, you know, ethically and, and otherwise in terms of journalistic standards, that's not for me to define. I think that um, the reason that it was released by CNN and then later the full document, or that the story was written by, written by CNN and that the full document was released by BuzzFeed is that there have been a lot of questions about these types of allegations. Um, they've been circulating in Washington and in the media for months. Um, and that they verified the source of the document was a legitimate former intelligence official who was a British intelligence official who had collected this information based on questions that he had gotten from um, clients in the United States that were both Democratic and Republican political interests. Um, he was conducting opposition research for them. Um, and um, that American intelligence sources have verified that in the past this, um, this agent uh, has collected valid information that is certifiable and that is usually well sourced. In the past, so we but, know that. But the, the the report included, for instance, the claim that attorney Michael Cohen, who's special counsel to the president-elect, met with Putin operatives in August and September in Prague. He categorically denied. He even tweeted the cover of his passport with the caption, I have never been to Prague in my life, hashtag fake news. Uh, Molly McHugh, after seeing that now they may be talking about a different uh, um, Michael Cohen, uh, what are your thoughts on, this? what's your gut feeling on this, this document? Sure. Well, look, there's a lot in there. There is, it's 35 pages long. It is not one thing that is a smoking gun. Um, there's a lot of information about business and other ties, about contacts between different members of the campaign. Um, and again, just in terms of sourcing, um, the, the officer, or the former intelligence officer who was collecting this information was using sources that he's used in the past um, that he would probably typically have relied on for other information and reporting what he gained from them to his clients and found that sufficiently concerning to um, pass it to official channels as well. Um, that's what we know. In terms now, of, me, are any of those specific events uh, you know, verifiable, I don't know. Let me, let me turn to William Jordan, because uh, you're a man used to reading diplomatic cables, right, and intelligence reports. Right. How did this thing read to you? Well, it read um, like an intelligence report. I mean, clearly this is uh, either a very good spoof of how intelligence uh, products tend to be written, or it's written by somebody who is it was in the game. I haven't seen any name yet given as to who this uh, this, this supposed intelligence uh, retired or ex British intelligence person was. Um, it's written. I mean, my first reaction to it was uh, was pretty dismissive in the sense that uh, um, it's hard to evaluate the claims that are in there. I mean, when you're working with uh, real intelligence information in a classified setting, a government setting, you can generally do cross-checking of, of, of information. Uh, this is sort of a, a, a finished report that contains a lot of raw information, but you really have no way of knowing who the, who the sources are and where it's all coming from. So, you know, the question that immediately comes to my mind is, is this some sort of great disinformation? Is this something that even the Russians could be putting out? I mean, somebody who knows how to use the lingo, and there's plenty of information out, or plenty of such documents out there, that anybody who wants to imitate this style could do so. So, I mean, one of the things that struck me about it, too, was if this has been floating around for so long in Washington, and people have been saying that it's been out there for weeks, why hasn't it come to light before? Um, you know, and, and, and I, I don't know whether it's correct to say that somebody in the intelligence community would have leaked this, as Donald Trump seems to allege may have happened. Uh, there are so many potential suspects out there because you've got uh, members of Congress who have seen this thing, you've got staffers, you've got a lot of people who have political ax to grind. I'm just surprised that it hasn't surfaced earlier. Uh, how much cred credence or weight to give it it's very hard to, to say because, like I say, it it reads somewhat authentically. The fact but, that it, but the fact that it didn't surface earlier does that tell you that well, it's probably not very serious. I'm shocked that there would be this level of specific accusation or this specific information, and nobody would have tried to make hay of it sooner, given all of the stuff mm. that's come out, uh, you know, on on Hillary Clinton and the uh, Democratic National uh, Committee. Michael Johns, your thoughts? Well, a few things. I mean, number one, I do believe, uh, as said earlier, that the ultimate determination on all of this is going to be the Russia policy and how that policy serves U.S. interests under the Trump administration. That's going to be the ultimate judge 
of what I think is a, a new fresh start in our relationship with Russia. So that's constructive. I mean, Trump has released a lot of disclosure, uh, all of what, what was required and then some uh, under uh, FEC and U.S. Um, uh, laws. Now, maybe those laws aren't are strict enough or those guidelines aren't strict enough. They could potentially be tightened. But, you know, the reality is, you know, from the hacking, which ultimately you have to blame, you know, the Democratic National Committee for not sufficiently protecting their systems, uh, to this report yesterday, which even the outlet that released it has, has backtracked on and acknowledged fundamental inaccuracies. It's all really ultimately a bunch of speculation, nor, by the way, I think it's important to note, is there anything particularly new in this style of uh, sort of, you know, rough treatment among uh, heads of state and countries? Michael, I mean, when you hear when you hear um, William Jordan say anybody could have put this stuff out there, including the Russians themselves, what are your thoughts on that? I think that's true. I think there's no doubt about that. The, you know, the origins of it are unclear and the uh, media outlet itself is uh, clearly made, you know, fundamental mistakes in the reporting. And I don't think it really points to any obvious conclusion except of, you know, a sort of baseless allegation. Um, you know, it, I, I think, you know, Trump's position on Russia throughout the campaign, including in this press conference today, was that the United States was going to defend U.S. interests. And hopefully that will include a very amicable relationship with Putin and Russia. But if it doesn't, then, you know, it's not going to be uh, a capitulation to Russian interests. This is a, a president-elect who throughout this campaign and, and, you know, as recently as today has made it very clear that he's going to stand very assertively for U.S. interests. I don't think there's really anything for the United States, for, the, for American people or for uh, free people of the world to be particularly concerned about. I do believe it's important to realize that Russia has been engaged in adversarial patterns of behavior. Uh, those may or may not improve under Trump. I think he's going to make an effort to to make them improve, and that includes cyber warfare, which clearly they've been engaged in. But the, the, ultimately, the determination of that is going to, uh, I think, flush out in our relationship uh, with Russia and our policies toward Russia, which really deserve a, the sort of fresh look that I think Trump's going to bring to it. All right, you talk about U.S. interests. Of course, there's also Trump's interests. That was the other big uh, facet uh, of this uh, press conference. And we'll talk more right. about those ties between uh, business and politics, especially when it comes to Russia. But first, uh, I want to talk with Caroline Fredrickson uh, about something our maybe viewers around the world don't know about. It's called the M M. Sorry. Emolument. Emolument. Thank you. I've always I knew I'd have trouble with the word. It's not very used very often. It means no. salary or payment. And there's a clause in the Constitution. I'll read it out. Article one, section nine, clause eight. No U.S. office holder shall, without the consent of Congress, accept of any present emolument, office or title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince or or foreign state. We saw, Caroline, a uh, legal counselor uh, come out uh, and give a long, detailed uh, explanation in legalese of how it was all going to be above board and there would be no uh, violation of the Constitution on January the 20th when uh, Donald Trump takes office and becomes president, having handed over his personal business interests to his two sons. Are you convinced? Well, you know, I have to say, I think that the, the ethics um, experts who uh, watched the, uh, the the statement and who uh, in the press conference were not convinced. Uh, uh, the Emoluments Clause is it's, it's an interesting one, because I think even those of us who spend a lot of time looking at the Constitution had to go back and reread that one, because it's not one that has been um, uh, very much of an issue. And unfortunately, I think it is now. Um, what the, the president and his counselor uh, articulated in the press conference is woefully short of what uh, uh, those of us who care about ethics um, were looking for. Um, we were looking for um, a much stronger uh, divestment of uh, uh, the president-elect's business interests than what he uh, put forward. Uh, you know, the, 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 the way that he has structured his family um, involvement in the business and in the government is enormously troubling. He didn't set up a blind trust, which has been the practice of all of his predecessors. Um, I think there is uh, an enormous possibility of entanglements 
uh, that uh, could be very compromising for the president-elect. Uh, he still has time his legal, to... his legal counsel said at one point there won't be a fire sale as, of his assets, as she put it, uh, and he should not be forced to destroy the company he built. <laughs> well, look, president, the president-elect decided to run for president. He didn't run for something uh, where he could be the president and continue to run an enormous business. That's just not what the American people are looking for. It's not what our Constitution envisions. Uh, we have to have a division. Uh, but in any case, a blind trust has been the practice of all of his predecessors. It would not require him to, I mean, he's an enormously wealthy man. He will remain enormously wealthy, uh, um, even with a blind trust. Um, and so I think in the best interest of our country, he has to move forward in a way that is going to be ethically above board uh, and is going to make people confident that he is doing the business of the American people and not the business of, you know, Putin, as in the previous conversation, or Trump uh, uh, enterprises. And uh, could he face impeachment? <laughs> well, that's a little a little premature, um, certainly. Um, uh, but I think there is, uh, is a good cause for him to be cautious in how he moves forward and reconsider the the arrangements he's established uh you know that there this country deserves the best and the brightest for our leadership and we need us to have somebody that we uh think is actually moving forward as i said in the nation's best interest as the as one of the world's if not the world superpower uh, we need somebody we can trust is doing it for the best interest of all of us and not for the best interest of his business. All right, Michael Johns, you heard there uh, Caroline Fredrickson say it's not too late for Trump to do a better job of building that firewall between uh, his uh, job as president and his business interests. I think what you got out of the press conference today, which is sort of what he had promised, but now he's delivered on, is a complete uh, disentanglement of him from the Trump organization and its companies, which will now be run by his two sons. And that is formulated, and that was the, the essence of the message from the legal counsel of the, of the Trump uh, organization today, uh, that he has signed all of that. This is as close to a blind trust as you can get. It's very somewhat different when you're dealing with hard assets as opposed to, say, you know, stocks or equities that could be you know, quickly moved into that. But in essence, that's what he's done. He is not involved in any capacity uh, going forward in leadership decisions or in the business of that company. He has done everything uh, short of the fire sale, which would be, I think, illogical and not justified, and it's not required by U.S. law. Uh, to put at ease any concerns that exist. To, to put at ease those concerns. We're going to have to take a quick break. I want to thank Caroline for being with us. I want to ask the rest of our panel to stay put. We'll be right back. It's the France 24 debate.